coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, addressing the ASEAN Plus 3 Summit in Myanmar. President Park geun proposes a three-way leaders' summit between South Korea, China and Japan. Korea's free trade agreements with Canada and Australia take one step closer to full ratification after a key parliamentary committee votes to approve both deals. Plus, less than 24 hours after the Philae probe made a historic landing on a comet hurtling through space, the first close-up images of the alien landscape have been sent back to Earth. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Friday, November 14th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Right, well, it's been quite a busy week for regional diplomacy, especially for Korean President Park Geun-hye, who, on top of her other agenda items, has expressed hope for a trilateral summit with China and Japan in the near future. Our Choi Yu-sun has more from the ASEAN Plus 3 meeting in Myanmar. At an annual meeting with the leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, China and Japan, hosted by Myanmar this year, President Park Geun-hye has openly expressed hopes to meet her Chinese and Japanese counterparts. This comes as historical and territorial differences in Northeast Asia have led tensions to rise in the region. The last time the three countries' leaders met was in 2012. A slight gaining of diplomatic momentum among the three nations was witnessed at the APEC summit in Beijing earlier this week when President Park talked about a tripartite foreign minister's meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Park also had a brief encounter with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, where the two leaders agreed to encourage officials involved in high-level talks to make progress in resolving Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. The leaders of China and Japan also met on the sidelines of that global forum. It, however, remains to be seen how the latest rounds of diplomacy and reconciliatory gestures will work to thaw Korea's relations with Japan, as Seoul is adamant Tokyo must first take responsibility for its past wrongdoings. Crediting the ASEAN cooperation and trust building as a model for her Northeast Asia peace initiative, President Park also sought the ASEAN, China and Japan support in encouraging North Korea to lay down its nuclear arms for the region's peace and stability. President Park now heads to Brisbane, Australia to attend this year's G20 Leaders Summit. There she will continue promoting her economic innovation plan as an initiative to address global problems of low growth and high unemployment. Choi yu -sun, Arirang News, Nepida. And staying in Myanmar, President Park and the leaders of 17 nations concluded their annual East Asia Summit on Thursday, where they addressed a number of regional and global issues. President Park called on the other member nations to actively cooperate in regional disaster management and health. On the Ebola crisis, the president spoke of Korea's dispatch of a medical team to West Africa and endorsed the East Asia Summit's plan to boost preventive systems to hopefully fight and eradicate the deadly virus. As Yusan mentioned in her previous report, President Park is currently en route to Australia to attend the G20 Summit in, in uh, Brisbane, the final leg of her current international trip. U.S. President Barack Obama has criticized the government of Myanmar just hours before his meeting with Thane Sein, his counterpart there in Myanmar, this on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit. In an interview with a Thailand-based magazine, Obama said there had been some progress after Myanmar transitioned from military to civilian rule back in 2010, but there has been a slowdown in democratic reforms and even some steps backward, unfortunately. He cited state restrictions on political prisoners, the oppression of free journalism and the persecution of the Muslim minority. Now back here 
in Korea. And the National Assembly's Foreign Affairs Committee has passed bills for free trade agreements with Australia and Canada, this paving the way for the full ratification of the pact's early next month. The ruling and opposition parties say they will ratify the trade agreements no later than December 2nd. To quell concerns, the FTAs will negatively impact Korea's livestock sector. Uh, the ministers of finance and agriculture agreed to offer local livestock farmers cheap loans and advice on how to export their products. Now, Korea's central bank has left its key interest rate steady at its uh, lowest ever level of 2%, but with mounting pressure to tackle the big problem of the weakening Japanese yen and how to prop up the sluggish domestic economy here in Korea, pundits are expecting another rate cut to a new record low to come sooner rather than later. Ah Hwang Jie reports. The Bank of Korea on Thursday decided to keep its key rate unchanged at 2%. This follows two previous rate cuts in the second half of this year that left the country's base rate at a historic low not seen since the height of the global financial crisis in 2009. The Monetary Policy Committee considered the fact that there's a need to wait and see the impact of the two previous rate cuts and to achieve financial stability amid the recent rapid rise in the country's household debt. Still, market expectations are mounting over an additional rate cut in the next couple of months. Analysts cite the domestic economy remaining sluggish despite aggressive government stimulus measures and other uncertainties abroad. Uh, recently, the uh, Bank of Japan decided to expand their QQE uh, surprisingly, and um, that actually had an uh, impact on the uh, one yen cross rate. And I think the you know business uh, the leaders, um, the the corporations, I think because of that uncertainty, they probably don't want to invest um, uh, at this point. Korea's top central banker, however, ruled out the possibility of more monetary easing to counteract the weak yen, saying the exchange rate is swayed more by factors like the conditions of major economies and international capital flow than the key interest rate. He added that the current 2 percent rate is accommodative enough to support the country's recovery momentum. Now all eyes are on the fourth quarter growth rate that will be unveiled in January. Experts say a worse than expected figure would add pressure on the central bank to further cut its key rate as a means to prop up growth. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now it has emerged that the Korean government sucked in a staggering 50 billion US dollars in tax revenue from the sales of goods like cigarettes, alcohol and lottery tickets in 2012. In a report released on Thursday, the Korea Tax Association said taxes on so-called SIN products accounted for 27, 27% of uh, total revenue in 2012. That was almost as much revenue generated through VAT or value-added taxes, which is the government's main source of income. SIN tax revenue outstripped both corporate and income tax in the same year. Watchers say that if Parliament passes a bill on raising taxes on cigarettes, the proportion of the government's revenue from so-called SIN taxes will grow even more in the years to come. Critics say these uh, high SIN taxes are unfair as they mostly target low-income earners. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. The Philae space probe that made history by touching down on a comet half a billion kilometers from Earth has achieved another remarkable first by sending back stunning images from the comet's surface. One of the first photos released by the European Space Agency, which we can see there, shows one of the lander's legs and the jagged, rocky surface of the comet. The agency thinks the lander could be resting on its side, possibly with one leg extended into open space. 
Another issue facing this mission is that uh, Philae appears to be sitting under the shadow of a huge cliff, so uh, scientists might have a hard time recharging its solar batteries. Now, you might be surprised to know that Philae has a Twitter account, so you can check out all the latest images as they come out from the comet by following at Philae 2014. A group of Korean medical personnel have embarked on a trip to Sierra Leone as part of government efforts to help contain the deadly Ebola virus in West Africa. The team will stay there for about one week to assess the dire conditions there so that Seoul can later decide on the final scale of a support team to go there after that team come back to Korea. Connie Kim reports. Korea dispatched its first group of medical personnel to Sierra Leone Thursday to give the Ebola-stricken country a much-needed helping hand. We will lay the groundwork to ensure the best conditions for our medical staff while they attend to the needs there. Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry says the volunteering doctors, nurses and military officers will first visit Britain before traveling to the West African country. The group is being dispatched in advance to check the medical facilities and working conditions in Sierra Leone. Staying there until November 21st, the Korean team will work at a British Ebola treatment facility in the capital Freetown with other health experts from countries such as Britain and Denmark. The deployment comes as the World Health Organization reports the total death toll from this Ebola outbreak has now surpassed 5,000. The number of new cases are slowing in Liberia and Guinea, but Ebola is still spreading fast in Sierra Leone. On Sunday alone, 111 new Ebola cases were reported in the West African country, one of the highest daily rates ever recorded. And making matters worse is that only 19 out of the 53 treatment centers in the country are operating due to a lack of medical supplies and personnel. As fears grow about the devastating effects Ebola is having on Sierra Leone, Korea has vowed to continue its support even after the first team returns to Korea. Okay. After receiving assessments from the first task force team, the Korean government will decide upon the final number of medical staff to send to Sierra Leone. 145 doctors, nurses, laboratory technicians and safety managers apply to join the global efforts. The number of applicants far outstripped the government's expectations, but Seoul only plans to send less than 40 personnel to the West African country by the end of December. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, the UN envoy on North Korean human rights has once again called on referring the regime's leader to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity and Serious Human Rights Violations. This comes as the UN General Assembly is expected to adopt a resolution on North Korean human rights next month. Our Hwang Sang-hee reports. UN Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights Marzuki Darusman reiterated that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un should be taken to the International Criminal Court for his serious human rights violations. Uh, it's, it's only now that we are now in a position to in fact direct culpability on the supreme leader for these massive human rights violations. At a forum in Seoul on Thursday, the UN envoy said the report published by the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea pointed unequivocally to the North Korean leadership for being responsible for the inhumane treatment of its 25 million population. Noting Pyongyang's recent invitation to Darusman, U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues Robert King said the report is effective in slowly changing the North. He's been denied visits to North Korea for four and a half years. The North Koreans indicate that they're willing to invite him to Pyongyang as long as the text of the resolution is modified. I think these are all very clear indications of North Korean concerns about the focus on their human rights record. As the UN General Assembly prepares to vote on the human rights resolution in mid-December, the two human rights figures agreed on adding more pressure on the regime. Both Darusman and King agreed that the next crucial step would be to link the North Korean human rights issue with security dimensions by listing it in the agenda of the UN Security Council. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, on a related note, North Korea may have found an ally 
in fighting against a UN draft resolution that aims to refer the regime to the ICC for its human rights violations, as we heard in their report there. Cuba reportedly has come up with a revised revision of the resolution, saying that the ICC referral sets a dangerous precedent that could be applied in the future against any developing country. It's believed the language may be aimed at garnering support from African countries. The UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution against North Korea's human rights abuses every single year since 2005, but this year's aims to go a step further and, uh, as we heard there, refer North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and others under him to The Hague. Now, shifting gears now to uh, a cultural event happening here in Seoul and Korea's largest art fair, which is devoted to introducing uh, limited edition artwork, has opened in the Korean capital on, this, uh, on Thursday. The art comes from far and wide, and it's not just limited to work by uh, Korean artists. Our Park Ji-won took a look around and filed this report. Ranging from photos and woodcut prints to 3D computer artwork, this fair is all about art pieces that have a limited number of editions. Since 1995, the annual International Art Fair has invited a number of participants and guests from all over the world. This year's includes 51 galleries from 15 countries. Those who visit will get close access to the artists themselves and exhibit booths. My works are about the endless networks of our lives that interconnect everyone. It looks like a plant as plants represent the circles of life, from its creation to extinction. In this project, um, I did a performance in a site near the Auschwitz camp where people were shot. And I asked the audience, there were about 300 people, I asked them to write down the names of the people they love and put them in candles and the candles went down the river to the ocean. So it became this kind of celebration of life. On the sidelines of the festival, diverse programs are being offered, from artist talks and collaborative projects to printmaking classes. The festival continues until this Sunday at the Hangaram Art Museum of Seoul Arts Center. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following on this Friday morning here in Seoul. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Liberia's president has announced she's ending a national state of emergency, citing improvements in the country's Ebola situation. While noting that the fight against the deadly virus was not over, President Ellen Johnson Sherliff said the country had come a long way since August when it became the outbreak's epicenter and the government had determined there was enough progress to lift the emergency measure. Meanwhile, Doctors Without Borders has agreed to partner with researchers in Europe to test two experimental drugs and one blood treatment at its clinics in West Africa, including Guinea and Liberia. So far, there is no vaccine for the hemorrhagic virus that has now killed more than 5,100 people and infected more than 14,000, mostly in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. On the crisis in Ukraine, Moscow and Kiev are exchanging barbs that the other had violated a September ceasefire, as NATO accuses Russia of sending military equipment and troops into rebel-held eastern Ukraine. International Monitor Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe said it spied a vehicle marked Cargo 200 among the clusters of Russian tanks, artillery and air defense systems entering Ukraine, a vehicle apparently used to transport soldiers soldiers' bodies. The United Nations Security Council also convened its 26th emergency session on Ukraine on Thursday on concerns that full-scale fighting could break out in the country's east. 
The Islamic State group has released audio it says captures the voice of its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, to apparently quell local rumors that the 44-year-old had been killed in U.S.-led coalition airstrikes last weekend. Released via social media, the voice in the 17-minute recording says the extremist group will never stop fighting in Iraq and Syria, even if only one soldier remains. It also mentions new oaths of allegiance from Egypt, Algeria and Liberia and calls on supporters to, quote, erupt volcanoes of jihad across the world, including in Sa Saudi Arabia, the leaders of which the voice says are the head of the snake. Attention all history buffs. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte's belongings will be going to auction this weekend in France, among them his iconic bicorn hat. Monaco's Prince Andrew said in a written statement his family will use the proceeds to refurbish their palace and to give the relics a new lease on life. The items were originally collected by the prince's great-grandfather, Louis II, a big admirer of Napoleon. The hat is expected to fetch up to 400,000 euros. That's about 500,000 U.S. dollars. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off in football this time, where Manchester United Ambassador Park Ji Sung was in Seoul on Thursday for the Manchester United Media Conference. And after expressing his gratitude in becoming an ambassador for his former team, he spoke about the current struggles the English club is currently facing, stating it's a phase that could happen when you change managers. He also added that although the Korean national football team is filled with young talents, it could be a tough task for them to win the upcoming Asian Cup, adding they need more time to adjust to head coach Uli Stilike's style of football. And speaking of which, the Korean national football team is set to play a couple of friendlies this month, starting off with a big match later tonight against Jordan. With the 66th-ranked Taegok Warriors facing off against the 74th-ranked Jordan at away, big questions surround the Korean national team with their star Son Heung-min likely out due to fatigued calves. But it's likely that filling in his role will be Kim min who is considered manager Uli Stilike's go-to guy so far in the short time he's managed the team. Meanwhile, Park Ji Young will be in the spotlight as well after being given his second chance with the national team once again. And moving out of the football pitch and to the ice rink, where the 2014-2015 ISU Speed Skating World Cup begins its new season at Salt Lake City, Utah. And for the fans here in Korea, all eyes will be on the two-time Olympic champion Lee Sang Hwa, who hopes to continue her dominance in the 500-meter event with Lee Sung Hoon and Mo Tae Bum looking to bounce back in the men's competition. But who can forget Park Sung Hee, the former Olympic short track gold medalist who's set to make her international debut in speed skating. Meanwhile, with seven World Cup events taking place this season, Korea will host a second event from November 21st to the 23rd. And now finishing things off in the major leagues where the Cy Young Award winners were announced and not much of a surprise over in the National League. Now receiving 30 out of 30 first place votes, LA Dodgers lefty Clayton Kershaw was voted unanimously as the 2014 National League Cy Young winner, winning his third in the past four years. Now Kershaw finished the season at 21-3 with a jaw-dropping 1.77 ERA. Meanwhile, over in the American League, Cleveland Indian Corey Kluber won his first Cy Young after posting a record of 18-9 with a 2.44 ERA and 269 strikeouts, beating out Felix Hernandez and Chris Saley. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, it seems like winter is already here. Snow is falling for the first time of the season in Seoul and Incheon. Well, it's more like flurries. And the cold air mass swept the peninsula overnight, dropping the temperatures to freezing side again. So cold winter morning is definitely ahead of us. While snow flurries are being seen in Seoul and Incheon, the other parts of the nation is waking up to mostly to partly sunny skies. 
and a few clouds will be followed by increasing sunshine. And the top temperatures will be higher today, though we will struggle to get out the single digits. So let's take a closer look at today's temperatures. Our daily low in Seoul started out at minus 1, and then the daytime high will rise to 10, while Daegu tops out 11, and Gwangju and Busan will climb to 12 this afternoon. And on to other regions. Jeju Island and Jeju will be getting up to 13 and 10 later on, while Tokyo should see a highs of 8. That's all for now. Back to you, Mark, in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. And that's all we have for you at this hour. For more of the latest developments, don't forget to check out our website, adidang.co.kr forward slash news. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye.